share my screen. All right, can everybody see the screen? So PowerPoint, yeah. y'all see that? Make sure I shared it correctly. All right, so this is the PowerPoint that I just added. Of course, you know, you can find pictures of all of these slides everywhere. Most of these came from the textbook. Um, and after I'm done going through these 30 slides or so with y'all, I will pull up the other file that has some pictures in it just so, so we can see it all together. But on the practical, you're going to have to be able to know three basic things about really all the tissues next week with the connective tissues. Number one, you're going to have to be able to identify them. So you take the practical, a picture of, I don't know, you know, uh, stratified squamous, uh, keratinized stratified squamous pops up. You have to be able to identify it. But you also may be required to answer just a couple of basic questions concerning a function of the tissue or a location of the tissue. So the goal of today's lab is to introduce you to what the tissues look like and go over some of their basic characteristics, functions, and locations. That's our job for today. And so your job over the course of this week is to, is to finalize your fit uh, and become very familiar with how to identify these tissues. So let's just get into our introduction um, of the chapter. Now, the information that I put together here kind of coincides with the Engage Lab Manual as well. So you need to always make sure that you're reviewing your chapter in the Engage Manual. So the introduction here begins with characteristics of all organisms. What kind of characteristics do all living organisms possess? Well, all organisms have what we call metabolism, and you might know heard of that term before. The term metabolism refers to all chemical reactions that go on inside of a living cell or organism. And those chemical reactions can be broken down into two main categories. There are some of the reactions are referred to as catabolic reactions or what we call catabolism. And this, these include the reactions where large molecules are broken down into smaller ones. Basically, the terms you used in general biology would have been uh, polymers are broken down into mon monomers. Because if you remember, monomers bond together to make up the long polymer. So catabolic reactions is really what happens when you eat food and you digest it. You break it down into smaller parts chemically. Anabolism is the exact opposite. Anabolism or anabolic reactions are reactions where the cells in our body take up the nutrients we provide them, the monomers, and they build their own molecules from it. Like when muscles get bigger, our muscle cells make more muscle protein when you go to work out. So in order for the muscles to make more protein, they have to acquire the building blocks for protein, which are amino acids. So catabolism, you break down large molecules or smaller ones. Anabolism, you build up large molecules from their smaller building blocks. That's basically what that is. All organisms respond to changes in stimulation or uh, stresses in their environment. So responsiveness is one of the most important that we cover through a whole year of AMP. Respond to changes in your environment. Those basically are, are really reflexes. So we covered that last week, homeostatic feedback loops and our environments that we have to respond to changes in include your internal environment as well as your external environment. Now, typically in class, if we were sitting in class, you know, I would tell people, okay, let's say you're walking across the street and you hear a car honking. You won't keep walking into the street. You, you heard a car honking. That means a car is coming down the street. You reacted to it and you back up. So that's, that's what we call sensing and responding. This, all of these life processes have to be performed in order for the organism to stay alive. In that simple example, if you kept walking into the street, the car might hit you. That's not good. So sensing and responding to changes in the environment is what we call responsiveness. 
Differentiation is the process whereby cells that are very generic become more specialized. So that's what we call cell specialization. Um, and an easy example to give you, although it's, it's pretty difficult scientifically to explain, is, is how a sperm fertilizes an egg and it forms one cell. You all might know it's called the zygote, right? So that one single cell that was formed from the sperm fertilizing an egg, every single cell in your body comes from that one cell. So that one cell called the zygote is very generic. But as it divides and divides and divides and divides, it's changing. It's turning genes on and it's turning genes off and the cells are becoming specialized. So that's called differentiation. Obviously reproduction is important because without reproduction, a species would just die off. So we have to reproduce to produce more individuals of the same species. Um, movement at all levels is important. Obviously gross movement, as if you're walking, like walking across the street, you're moving. Um, but we also have movement at the cell level. We have movement at the subcell level. So cells around your body can move around your body. And then there are certain uh, molecules and, and organelles that move around on the insides of cells, so which is important. And we get into more of that later on. Now, as far as growth is concerned, there's two ways that we get bigger. The cells that we have, that we already have, when we're born, and that's from all the cell division from that fertilized egg, some of the cells we have get allow us to gain more mass just by getting bigger that's called hypertrophy that's what this first word is so for instance our muscles get bigger when we work out not because we're gaining more muscle cells but because the muscle cells we have in that muscle organ individually get bigger that's called hypertrophy Another way that we gain more mass and more stuff that makes us up is when we, we gain more cells. So in some instances, we, our cells divide, and divide, divide, and we gain more of them. That's called hyperplasia. That's what this word is right here, all right? So this is just an introduction. We're not gonna get into all of the details in that. You're, you're doing a little bit more with that in lecture, all right? But our book, our engaged book describes these. So make sure you read through that little introductory part in the very beginning of it. Now, there are four basic types of tissues that make up everything in our body, which is kind of strange if you think about it. I mean, our, we have our brain is different. Our, we have a liver, our stomach, our intestinal lungs, you know, our skin. We have all kinds of different cells, the cells that make up the different parts of the eyeball, you know? So, it's kind of strange to think that every single thing in our body is made up from four different tissues, but we have four basic tissues. Now, under each one of these examples, though, the four types of tissue, there are many different types of them. So we're about to cover several different types of epithelial tissues today. Next week, we're gonna cover several different types of connective tissues. Later on in the semester, we're going to cover the three basic muscle types. And then, obviously, we're going to go over nervous tissue when we cover the nervous tissue chapter later on in the semester. So today, we're going to focus on this group of tissue cells called the epithelial tissue. So just to let you know, a tissue, a name on the end of this name, tissues are groups of cells that are the same in our body or similar and have the same or similar functions. So epithelial tissues have the same basic characteristics, although they might have their own specific function, they're about the same, which those functions and characteristics are different from connective tissues, which are different from muscle tissue, so forth and so on. So those four basic tissues have some basic characteristics. Here's just an overview of them. Like I said, we're covering epithelial today. 
connective next week, muscle later on, and nervous tissue later on in the semester. But just very generically, epithelial tissues cover every single surface of our body. Any, any lining surface, open surface, everybody think the outside of our body, you know, our, the surface of our skin, that's an epithelium. The inside of your mouth, the inside of your stomach, the inside of any hollow organ, all lined by epithelial tissue, right? Um, the tissue actually lies or sits on what we call a basement membrane. I'm gonna show you the picture in a second. But all epithelial tissues, the tissue cells themselves sit on what we call a basement membrane. And all epithelial tissues are loaded down with many, many, many cells. So we say it's highly cellular. And since it's highly cellular, the cells are very closely packed together, which means there's not very much stuff between the cells. And we're gonna look at that in a second, what the, the name of that stuff is. So there's not a whole lot of what, what we call extracellular matrix between them. So epithelial tissues, or what we call epithelia, form what we call covering and lining epithelia or glandular epithelia. Every single gland that's in our body is made from a glandular epithelium. Those glands can be exocrine glands like salivary glands in your, in your oral cavity that produce saliva, or it could be your adrenal glands, your thyroid gland, glands that make hormones. So those glandular structures in our body are all formed from epithelium. Connective tissues, which abbreviated CT, have fewer cells per density per volume. The cells are more spread out, which means there's a whole lot of stuff that separates them. So all of the material that's on the outside of cells could be water, protein, sugars. All the stuff that's on the outside of cells is called the extracellular matrix or the ECM. So connective tissues have a lot of ECM because the cells are spread out. Epithelial tissues have a very little ECM because the cells are highly stuck together, right? Now, connective tissue is the most abundant and most spread out and diverse group of tissues in our body, found everywhere, connective tissues. This is gonna be the topic for next week's discussion. There are three basic types of muscle tissue and they all do exactly the same thing. Muscle tissue exerts force and generates movement by doing these two things. They contract and they relax. All muscle tissue is self-excitable. They're excitable. So what does that mean? Well, we're gonna learn later on that excitable cells are cells that have the ability to generate electrical impulses. So we say they're electrically excitable. Nervous tissue cells like neurons are electrically excitable. The functional cells of the nervous system include what we call neurons and then uh, cells called neuroglial cells. Again, we're gonna cover this later on. Now, just to let you know for now, the three types of muscle tissue in the body, you probably already know them, you know, at least a couple of them, skeletal muscle. Those are the muscles that allow you to move. They contract and your arms and legs move. And your heart, which we call cardiac muscle, when it contracts and relaxes, it moves blood through your cardiovascular system. And then we have smooth muscle. And depending on where it's at, the the action of smooth muscle is different. I don't want to get into that yet. That's a whole conversation for later on. But smooth muscle is found in places like around your stomach. It's found in aligning a po portion of the uterus and the female reproductive tract. It's found around your blood vessels in your body. So it's, it's located in several different places. All right, so let's look at what epithelial tissues look like in general and what some of their characteristics are, some general characteristics. Right. So as you can see from this first picture, you can see the delineation of the cells in here. So that little line right there, that's one cell. 
separated from another cell, separated from another one, so forth and so on. And many of the cells, you can see the little, this dark circle inside of it. That's the nucleus of the various cells that form this particular epithelial tissue. Now, one thing you can see right away besides, you know, you can see the, the plasma membrane. That's what these little lines are, the membrane of the cell, right? You learned about plasma membranes in, in general biology. So the plasma membrane separates one cell from another one. And then obviously you can see the nucleus inside of it. And then everything on the inside of it is called the cytoplasm, if you remember those terms. But what you can see right away is that the cells all touch each other. One membrane touches another membrane. So that is exactly why epithelial tissues have very little ECM. Since the cells are so closely packed together, there's not much stuff between them, right? Now, the other thing that you see here is just a little graphic. This is a generic drawing of a type of epithelium in the body. In fact, this is what we would call, as we'll learn in a minute, simple columnar epithelium. There's only one row of cells and these cells are column shaped. So they're taller than they are wide. But the reason why this picture is here is to show you uh, the generic layout for all epithelia. All epithelial tissues, whether they're one cell layer tall or there are many, many, many layers of cells in the tissue, like this picture over here, many, many layers of cells where the cells are stuck on each other. At the bottom of the epithelium, there's always this area which we call the basement membrane. So in this picture, this little graphic, this little darker blue area, this is called a basement membrane. Now there are two parts to the basement membrane. There's a basal layer, which is right below what's called the basal lamina, right below the epithelium. And then a deeper layer just below that one is called the reticular layer. And that layer sits on a connective tissue. So everything below what I'm calling the basement membrane right here, everything down is a connective tissue, which we'll be covering next week. So all epithelial tissues sit on top of a basement membrane that have some connective tissue that's below it. All right. So let's go over some of the basic characteristics. And I might pull that picture back up to show you what some of these, why some of these characteristics are there. So first of all, ep all epithelia are highly cellular, packed with cells, a whole bunch of cells stuck together. So there's very little ECM. All epithelial tissues lie on a basement membrane, sit right on top of it. It's connective tissue below the basement membrane. Epithelial tissues always have some cells that have what we call a free surface. There's the free edge or the free surface of an epithelial cell is called the apical surface, apical. And I'll show you that in the other picture in a second. So the apical surface of all cells that basically protrude towards the surface of the epithelium uh, faces the outside of the epithelium or it faces the inside of a hollow space or organ, which may be filled with fluid. Right. So, for instance, the cells that line the inside of your stomach, where your food goes when you eat food, the cells at the very surface of that tissue are facing the inside of your stomach. So that's a fruit, what we would call the free edge or the apical surface of that cell. The other thing that's pretty interesting about all epithelial tissues is that they have a great capacity to undergo mitosis. You guys remember the word mitosis from general biology, I'm sure. That's basically cell division, right? It's a cloning event, that's what mitosis is. So since epithelial cells have a great capacity, very high capacity to undergo mitotic division, all epithelial tissues can regenerate very efficiently. A very easy example of this, if you cut your skin, it heals. A few days later, if it's not infected, you know, a week or so, depending on how deep it was cut, it, you can see it's healing. The cells replenish themselves very quickly by cell division. 
Now, that rapid cell division rate also can lend itself to being the origin of many cancers in the body. So everybody's heard of the word cancer. I'm sure you know a little bit about it, but uh, cancerous tumors, or really even a benign tumor, the cells divide over and over and over. And that's one of the characteristics of cancer is that cancer tumors, cancerous tumors or malignant tumors have the ability to grow fairly quickly. And then since it's what we call malignant or cancerous, those cells can go beyond the boundary of where the tumor started and spread around the body. That's what malignancy is. When a tumor, when a cancer spreads, it's called a metastatic malignant tumor. So those cancers ultimately sometimes, not always, have an epithelial origin. But cancers can, can arise from the different other types of tissues in the body as well, not just epithelium. Now, all epithelial tissues are also avascular. This means there's no blood vessels that run through the epithelium. So if there's no blood vessels running through the epithelia around the body, how do all the epithelial cells get the nutrients and oxygen they need? Well, there's a diffusion through the basement membrane. So let's go back to this picture real quick. Here's our epithelial tissue right here. Now look at these cells. This epithelium at the top would face a free edge. This would be an open space up here. In fact, this type of epithelium that's drawn right here is an example that would come from your small intestine. So as you send food through your small intestine, it would pass up here at the surface. Your food would go down your intestine up here. So this edge right here at the top is what we call the apical membrane or the apical surface. The surfaces on the sides are the lateral membranes, because they're lateral, and the surfaces at the bottom that physically touch and anchor to the basement membrane is called the basal membrane, or we, we combine the two terms and say basolateral membranes. So as we get into AMP2, we have to use those terms a little bit more because we're going to be looking at a distinction between the types of receptors and transporters that are stationed along the length of this membrane. Some are at the top, some are on the sides, and some are on the bottom. So we're typically, we will typically say, okay, we have the sodium potassium pump isolated at the basolateral membrane. That's how we would use that, that word in a, in, a, in a sentence. So these are called the basolateral membranes and this is the apical membrane. Now notice in this picture that there's no blood vessel going between these epithelial cells up here because all epithelial tissues are avascular. There's no blood vessels in there. So since there's no blood vessels in here, all of these epithelial cells and even over here, there's no blood vessels running through this tissue anywhere. So how do all of these cells, in, especially in this multi-layered tissue, how do these cells get what they need to live? Oxygen, nutrients, and thus get rid of their, their waste products. Well, it happens this way. In this generic picture over here, all of the blood vessels run in an underlying connective tissue. So remember, we have the epithelium, we have a basement membrane, and then we have connective tissue at the bottom. Connective tissues, by the way, are highly vascular. This is where all of your blood vessels are running in your connective tissues like this. So we would have our nutrients and um, oxygen diffusing from the blood out of the blood vessel through the connective tissue. Then it would go through the basement membrane to get to the cells that lie on top of the membrane. All of their waste products would have to go in the opposite direction carbon dioxide, lactic acid, other organic acids or excess material would have to go through the basal membrane, through the basement membrane itself. And, and when I say basal membrane, I'm talking about the plasma me membrane here. When I say basement membrane, I'm talking about these proteins and polysaccharides that make up uh, this surface that the cells sit on. 
So all the waste products go through the basement membrane, through the connective tissue, and back into the blood. So there's an exchange of nutrients and waste to and from connective tissue, the basement membrane, and epithelium constantly. So that's the direction in which things are moving. All right. All right. Now, does anybody have any questions about those general characteristics before I move forward? All right. If at any time I might be going too fast for you or you have a question, just unmute yourself and just holler at me. All right. Oh, also, if you do have a question, unless you're trying to ask another student, I do not see the little chat button down here when I'm, when I'm recording, so I can't follow any chat that you might be typing in. So again, if you need to speak with me, just unmute and holler at me, all right? All right, now, this is the part of the packet where we start getting into the actual nitty gritty of the epithelia in the body. And before we get to the specific examples, we have to learn how we name epithelium in the body. So some of y'all might know this already. It's pretty basic. Some people have had this before, just bear with me, all right? Uh, some people, they're seeing this for the first time. But nonetheless, epithelial tissues are named because of the, the number of rows of cells that make up the tissue and by the cell shape the shape of the cells that make up the tissue. So for instance, an epithelial tissue that's only made up of one row of cells, meaning this, all the cells in the tissue touch the basement membrane. If you only have one row, all of them have to sit on the basement membrane, just like you see in this picture, that type of epithelium would have the word simple in the name. It would be simple, blah, 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 epithelium, right? Then we have some tissues, epithelial tissues, that have multiple layers of cells that make up the tissue layer itself, in which case not every single epithelial cell sits on the basement membrane. Only the cells at the very bottom would sit on the basement membrane. The cells above it, don't sit on the basement membrane because they're sitting on the cell that is sitting on the basement membrane. So I think this is self-explanatory, right? So any tissue that is made up of multiple layers is called stratified. And then we have this weird one. In the middle, we're going to cover one type of pseudo stratified epithelium. And this particular type of epithelium is called pseudo stratified because the prefix pseudo, as you probably know, is it means false. So this type of tissue looks like, if you looked at it under a microscope, it would look like there's multiple layers of cells because the nuclei are staggered. Some nuclei are lower, some nuclei are higher up in the, in, in the cell that makes up the tissue. However, every single one of these cells that make up this tissue touch the basement membrane but not all of the cells that make up this tissue go all the way to the apical surface, which means in a pseudostratified epithelium, some of the cells are taller and some of the cells are shorter. So not every cell goes to the top, but every one of the cells touch the bottom. And again, since all of the cells touch the bottom, that means you really only have one layer of cells. But in this special case, we don't call it simple. We call it pseudo stratified, which means falsely stratified, right? So we have a simple epithelia, we have pseudo stratified and stratified epithelial tissue examples we have to cover. Now, the other part of the name that we, we're gonna have is based on the actual shape of the cell. What are the shapes of the cells? And more often than not, it's the cells at the, at the surface that we name it by, but what are the shapes? So here are the shapes. The first type are, include cells that are flattened out. So you can see this cell is flat. So from this little kind of side view, side top view, you can see that the cells are squished down. 
They have this little squished out or flattened out appearance. Those cells are called squamous cells, or some people say squamous. Both pronunciations are fine. So this squamous or squamous epithelium includes cells that are flat. And the word squamous in Latin means flat or scale-like, by the way. So they're flattened out. So you might have something called a simple squamous epithelium. We're going to put both of those names to use in the name of our epithelium. You might have a stratified squamous epithelium. We're going to cover those examples. And so the bare minimum will always have at least three words that make up the name of the tissue. Again, like simple, one word, squamous, and then you have to say epithelium after it. So that's three words. Sometimes we have more than that, and I'll get to those specific examples in a minute. Now, if we have epithelial cells that are equal in height and width and depth in those dimensions, we call them cuboidal. It resembles a cube. Now, more often than not, when we look at it, you know, the tissue in a living, you know, from a living organism, the, the cells aren't perfect squares. They kind of have little rounded edges to them, but for the most part, they're about equal in height and width and depth. So they resemble a cube, so we call them cuboidal. Cells that are taller than they are wide are called columnar cells because they look like a column. Now in every one of these examples, you can see there's a basement membrane below all of the cells that, that we're calling the epithelium, all those cells sit on top of that basement membrane, all right? All right, so let's go through our examples. I'm gonna show you a couple of different types of pictures because I know on the practical, when you see these pictures, they're gonna show you different views of them, all right? So on the practical, you're gonna have to be able to identify them. You're gonna have to know a little bit about where they're located and what they do, some basic characteristics. So in this first example of an epithelium that we cover, we always start with simple squamous epithelium. Simple squamous epithelium, right off the bat, since it has the word simple in it, you know there's only one row of cells. And that's what we see here in this little picture, one row. There's not cells on top of those, it's just one row. And since it's squamous cells, that means they're flat, all right? And, the, and, and it's obviously an epithelium. So here's the epithelium. You look at it kind of from a top view, the cells are kind of broad, but from the side view, they're flattened out. So I always like to tell students, you know, from the top view, it's like a pizza box. A pizza box is broad, but if you look at a pizza box from the side, it's skinny. Um, also, when you look at these cells, depending on which view that we're looking at it, like from the top like this, some students, in, like, at least in lab, say they kind of look like scram, uh, 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 eggs that are cooking, you know, like uh, the yolk of an egg in there would look, resemble an egg. But it depends on the view that you're looking at it. So this is kind of from a top view. And I'll show you another picture of that later on when I'm done with this packet. But if we look at the cell in a tissue, but only see it from the side view, just right here, this is what it looks like. This is a section through a kidney, by the way. These are little tubules. These are cuboidal cells. We're gonna to get to those in a minute. But look right here with the arrows pointing. You see that little purple structure? That's the nucleus of a simple squamous epithelial cell. Oh, I forgot to tell you this as well. Although it doesn't show it too well in this little diagram. Typically a simple squamous epithelial cell's nucleus is flattened out and elongated a little bit. And so it doesn't make a perfect circle like this cell over here. The nucleus is a perfect circle almost. Look at this nucleus, it's kind of stretched out and flat. Same thing with that one. Same thing with this one. Same thing with that one. These cells that are interlinked this way forming this circle is the place where the simple squamous epithelium is in the kidney, right here. So this whole structure right here, that surround, this, this is a group of capillaries in here. This structure is called the Bowman's capsule. You're gonna learn that later on, but um, this is the simple squamous epithelium and that's the nucleus right there, that little elongated purple structure. 
Here's another view of, of a simple squamous epithelium. So let me explain to you what you're looking at. If you look at the very outside of your abdominal organs, here they show like the stomach and uh, the liver, but the intestines, the small intestine and the large intestine. If you could open up an organism and touch the small intestine on the outside of it, you would be touching this surface that looks purple right here. So this out here is where your finger would be coming in. You would touch the top this way. So the very top of our abdominal organs in here is lined by a special membrane that's made up of simple squamous epithelial cells. And the membrane that surrounds the very outer surface of your gastrointestinal organs in here, in your abdominal cavity, is called the peritoneum. Right here, you see that word? So the generic epithelial membrane that surrounds certain organs in the body are called mesothelial membranes. I'm going to show you all of these uh, membrane names uh, at the very end. I'm going to pull up the engage manual. But a mesothelial membrane is a special name for a simple squamous epithelium that lines the outside of our gastrointestinal tract. And the membrane specific name is called the peritoneum. So we would call that the peritoneal membrane. And it's, it's made up of a simple squamous epithelium. So what you see below it down here is not the simple squamous epithelium. There's muscle tissue down here, there's connective tissue in here, and there's a basement membrane right below this dark purple layer. You can't really see it too well, but there would be a basement membrane, there's some of the areolar tissue right there making it up. Right below there, that basement membrane it is what these simple squamous cells are sitting on. So if you happen to see a picture like this, and they got a pointer up here. That is a simple squamous epithelium. In particular, it is a mesothelial membrane. And this one is called the peritoneum. All right, so does anybody have any questions about that? So the simple squamous epithelium is only on the outside, not below it, in here. And also, I need to mention this, you're looking at it from the side view. That's why the cells don't look broad and flat like this, because you're looking at it from the side view like that. So that's what you're looking at right there, all right? All right, now here's another picture of simple squamous epithelium, and then we're going to get into their characteristics. This is a section through the lung. Now, deep in our lung, where everybody calls it the air sacs, I hate calling it that, as we get to AMP2 later, I'm gonna tell you why, but we have something called an alveolar sac. So we don't, th these, what everybody calls the air sacs where gas exchange occurs or these little holes, these are called alveoli. Now, if I were able to open up the thoracic cavity and stick my finger directly on a lung, I would be touching this surface right here. So my finger would come in and I would touch, boom, the surface right there. The very outer part of the lung is formed by another simple squamous membrane called the pleural membranes, the pleura. Pleura means lungs. The membrane on the outside of it technically is called the visceral pleura, but that is a simple squamous epithelium. Again, we're looking at the cells from the side view just at the very top up here. See how it kind of is elongated? That's the nucleus right there. So just at the top, that's the simple squamous epithelium that makes up the pleura membranes, all right? Now, deep to that, you would have a basement membrane. You have a little bit of connective tissue in there with some blood vessels, small arteries and veins running there. And then you have these little open areas. This is where the majority of gas exchange occurs in our lungs. We're gonna get to that later. But the reason why this picture's here is look at the circle that's being made up. These are simple squamous epithelial cells that line together to form this open circle. So again, you're looking at them from the side view. 
So these are simple squamous epithelial cells right here. And these are simple squamous epithelial cells at the top. So those simple squamous cells are all flattened out when we look at them from the side view. I'm gonna have to show you another picture to show you what it looks like from the top view, and I'm gonna do that when we're done. But let's go through uh, the information concerning simple squamous epithelial tissues. So obviously you have one layer of flat cells, that's just by definition of the name, simple squamous, one layer of flat cells. Since the cells are flattened out, they have a very specialized function. They function in gas exchange. Oxygen and CO2 are exchanged to and from the blood vessels to and from this, this little circular structure called the alveolus. So oxygen is loaded into the blood vessel. CO2 is unloaded from the blood into the little space, and then we breathe it out. So we're going to get into that physiology later on. But gas exchange is a pretty important function because that's obviously what happens in the lung where our simple squamous tissue is located. Since these cells are flattened out, the exchange of gases happen very quickly because there's not very much cytoplasm in the cell for the gases to move through because they're all flat. Same thing with what we call filtration and absorption. So, Filtration is an example of what happens in the kidney. As we send blood into the kidney, you guys know your kidneys filter your blood. Well, our kidneys, the, fil the filtration membrane is made up of a simple squamous epithelium. And so we filter out all of the substances in the blood, including what we would call our waste products, and even some things, are, which I call good things, are all filtered out into a special tube in the kidney, which we're gonna look at next. So filtration is an important function of simple squamous epithelium. The reduction in friction is also important. If I go back to this membrane, this mesothelial membrane called the peritoneum, look, it's on the outside of your organs in your abdominal cavity. You might not know it, but these organs actually have movement. There's, there's smooth muscle that surrounds the tubes. In our, in our abdominal cavity. So when the smooth muscle on those organs are contracting, you guys know your stomach churns up your food. So it's smooth, the, the, the smooth muscle contracts. Muscle contractions in your intestine moves your food through the intestine. Same thing through the colon or large intestine. So all of those organs have to slide past each other without generating friction. If they generated friction, they would produce heat, which would produce an inflammatory response which would be bad. So we have to lubricate them. The lubrication comes from these simple squamous tissues that lie the outside of the organ. These mesothelial membranes secrete a slippery fluid, a lubricating fluid to the outside of them. And so a reduction in friction is an important characteristic. So we have those membranes that surround the abdominal organs it surrounds your heart, which is called the pericardial membranes, and surrounds your lungs. I mean, let's face it, everybody knows your heart's sitting there beating in your thoracic cavity, you know, moving around in there. So if it didn't have this lubricating membrane around it, it would generate friction, which would be bad as well. Same thing with your lungs. Your lungs are moving. So reduction in friction is important. Now, you're going to have to know some of these basic locations. And also, in Chapter 4 of your textbook, you can find the pictures, location, structure, and function of all of the tissues. That's basically where this stuff comes from, from chapter four of your lecture book. If you have your lecture book. If not, you can just learn it off of here. But our, blood, our, our simple squamous epithelium lines all the blood vessels in the body. I'm going to tell you the special name for them in a minute. It lines the alveoli of the lungs, which are the little areas where we have gas exchange in the lung. It lines the filter membrane in the kidney, which is called the glomerulus. That's the name of the filtration membrane in the kidney. It's called the glomerulus. It lines all of your body cavities, which include the cavities that, enc that encompass your lungs, which would be called the pleural membranes, your heart, called the pericardial membranes, and your gastrointestinal organs in the abdomen. And those membranes are called the peritoneum. Right, so these are some of the important information 
uh, characteristics, location, function for simple squamous epithelium. So you need to make sure you know that. All right, let's get into simple cuboidal epithelium. So just by saying this name, I know I'm talking about a, a tissue that's made of one layer of cells and the cells are cube shaped, simple cuboidal. So look at this picture they have up here. In fact, the picture that they have up here, actually, um, it, yeah, those might come from the kidney, but it also looks like a gland. I'm about to show you this gland in a minute. So uh, these are tubules in the kidney. And if you notice, these, uh, the cells look like they're perfect little squares that line these little tubes located in the kidney. If we look at an enlarged picture of it, you can see they look like a little square. And the nucleus is almost perfectly round and centrally located in the cell. So whenever you look at a tissue and you see a cell that looks like a square, and sometimes they're a little rounded, but resemble a cube, it's always cuboidal, epithelium. So here is a tubule in the kidney cut in cross section. And so this would come out of the plane of the screen at you like, like a hose pipe like a garden hose would come out of the, you know, like a long tube. If we looked at this tube in a longitudinal section, it would look like the picture down here at the bottom. So here's the tube, here's the middle of the tube where the fluid would run after the kidney filters the blood, the fluid flows in this tube. You can see the cuboidal cells here that line the tube. So this is also simple cuboidal epithelium. Here's another picture of it, that same picture, just a little bit larger. And this is longitudinal, a longitudinal section. Here is a, another type of uh, simple cuboidal epithelium. It's lining a gland. You can, that's why I was saying, you see, it looks very similar to the other picture. But nonetheless, you're just gonna call this simple cuboidal epithelium. So cuboidal epithelium, also forms the glands in the body. This represents a thyroid gland. It, it's located just, this is your Adam's apple, by the way. It's called a thyroid cartilage. This whole structure is called your voice box of the larynx. So if you locate your Adam's apple, just go below it and kind of palpitate on the side of your windpipe, you would feel your thyroid gland. If you, if you take a section of it and look at it under a microscope, it looks like this. You see all these little circles in there and Lining the little circle are the cuboidal cells. Now, cuboidal cells are very easily identifiable, not only because they look like little squares, but because their nucleus is almost always a perfect circle. So that's kind of a, a giveaway as well, that perfect circular nucleus that's centrally located in the cell. So this is a simple, a simple cuboidal epithelium right here as well. Here's another, another slide of the thyroid gland. You can see this is a, a, another stain right here, but you see the, the cuboidal cells. This is just a different type of stain off of a light microscope. These are also cuboidal cells that are lining. This is called a thyroid follicle. We're gonna learn that later, but this is a thyroid gland. So all glands in our body are made from glandular epithelium, which is predominantly cuboidal cells. So let's look at some of their characteristics. Simple cuboidal epithelium, obviously a single layer of cube shaped cells, all right? That's how we're identifying them. They function in absorption and secretion. That's what cuboidal cells do. So absorption is the ability to bring in molecules, fluid from the outside of the cell across the membrane to the inside of the cell. And the absorption process can also mean that the substances go from the apical membrane across the basal lateral membranes, across the basement membrane of the simple cuboidal epithelium. So let's go back to this picture and I'll show you. So in this case, here's a simple cuboidal epithelium. The apical membrane of this cell is this edge right here because it faces this open area. This open area is what we call the colloidal area because it has a colloidal solution in here. 
these cells are involved in making thyroid hormones. So at this apical membrane right here, there are protein substances and thyroid hormones that go from out here across the apical membrane that have to go through the cytoplasm and across the basal lateral membrane. It's better to show you right here. Here's a blood vessel over here. Across the apical membrane, through the cell, across the basal lateral membrane before the hormone can get into the blood vessel. So that's absorption. You're absorbing something through the cell, all right? Now, secretion is the opposite movement. It's where some product, like a hormone, is made on the inside of the cell, and the product then is ex expelled through the apical membrane. And we call that, when something is expelled through the apical membrane, going from in here, through the apical membrane, that's called secretion. So when something goes through the apical membrane, it's called secretion. When the substances go back into the cell through the apical membrane, that's called absorption. So cuboidal cells both can absorb and secrete. Now, in the kidney tubule, we have reabsorption of material from the lumen of the tube uh, for the substances that we have to put back into the blood and waste products go in the opposite direction. So I want to show you this kidney tubule again. Because although everybody knows that the kidneys filter your blood, you may not know that, the, that pretty much everything in the blood is filtered out at the filter except for blood cells and large plasma proteins. Pretty much everything else is filtered out, which is bad because if we didn't reclaim the good stuff that we filtered out, you would just constantly urinate out all of your nutrients. That would be bad. So when the kidney is filtering the blood, the fluid that comes out has good stuff in it and bad stuff in it. All of that fluid called filtrate flows through this tube right here. So all of the cuboidal cells that line this tube have the job of doing two things taking all of the good stuff, the good material, your nutrients like sugar, amino acids, small vitamins that get filtered out, we have to reabsorb them through the apical membrane to put it back into a blood vessel that lies out here. So we can reclaim all the good stuff that the kidney filtered out. That is an absorption process, but since we are putting it all the way into the blood from in here, we call it reabsorption because we filtered it out somewhere. Now, these cells also have the ability, though, to excrete waste products from a blood vessel that lies behind them. That waste product can go through the basal lateral membranes all the way through the cytoplasm and through the apical membrane to get into the flowing fluid. So by the time this fluid that flows through this tube, by the time it gets to the end of the tube, it's going, whatever's in that fluid is going to be lost in urine because it becomes urine at that point. And that's physiology we cover in AMP2. I'm just giving you a brief overview right now. So these, these cuboidal cells can reabsorb nutrients and secrete waste products. So that's why their function, they function in absorption and secretion. All right. So these types of cells or tissue found in kidney tubules and found, you know, I put the thyroid gland here, but it's pretty much found in all the glands in the body. But at least no, you know, the thyroid gland, because that's the picture they give you in your textbook. These pictures, that's why I wrote that. Now, let's go over a simple columnar epithelia. There's a couple of different types of simple columnar, but let me just go over the generics with you first. First of all, it's obviously one layer of cells that are column shaped, simple columnar. And so you can see them here. Here's the epithelium right here. They're actually showing you an example of what we call non-ciliated simple columnar epithelium. So you see right here the name, non-ciliated simple columnar epithelium. That's because columnar epithelial tissues can either have cilia at the surface, which are hair-like structures, or it can be absent. That's some... That's some specializations at the apical membrane we're about to cover. 
So in this case, this is a non-ciliated, simple columnar epithelium that lines a small intestine. So when you send food through your small intestine, the food goes across the apical surface, the digested, chemically digested food molecules go through the apical surface, through the cell, and then into blood vessels that lie in the underlying connective tissue. And in that way, you just absorb nutrients from the food you ate. Also notice that the cells of simple columnar uh, tissue epithelia typically lie closer towards the basement membrane down here at the bottom. And sometimes they're a little elongated as well. Now, spread out through simple columnar epithelial tissue cells are these cells. These cells are called goblet cells. Here it is enlarged. Here it is in a little graphic. These little goblet cells secrete mucus. And the mucus goes to the apical membrane up here. Now, if you look at this drawing, everybody asks me when I go over this in class, well, it looks like there's little hairs up there. How come that's non-ciliated? Because these are not cilia, these are, which are hair-like structures. These are extensions of the apical membrane that go up and down. So these little extensions are called microvilli and they don't move around. They basically just increase the surface area so we could absorb our food uh, molecules, our nutrients, all right? Here's another picture of non-ciliated simple columnar epithelium. This is a picture uh, from the small intestine. This finger-like structure is called a villus. So from here to here is the epithelium. This is the simple columnar epithelium right here. This would be the basement membrane at the bottom, and down here would be connective tissue with blood vessels all in here. So our food molecules pass out here, and we absorb our nutrients through that simple columnar epithelium. This little clear-like structure is the goblet cell that secretes mucus to the surface of it. Now, another type of simple columnar epithelium is found in the female reproductive tract, in the fallopian tubes or what we call the uterine tubes. The fallopian tubes or the uterine tubes is what carries the egg being produced by the ovary down towards the uterus. Here's the uterus, if you don't know the, the female tract, the organs yet. So you see this hollow tube right here going, connecting to the inside of the uterus. This hollow tube is lined by a simple columnar epithelium but those columnar cells have cilia at the top. Those little cilia actually beat in a wave-like fashion. And what that does is creates a current of fluid. So fluid would be moving across the surface of this tissue because the cilia move. And the cilia beat in order to move that fluid and thus can carry, in this case, the egg down towards the uterus, all right? So this is what we call ciliated simple columnar epithelium because there's cilia at the top. This is non-ciliated simple columnar epithelium located in the small intestine. This is ciliated simple columnar epithelium located in the uterine or fallopian tubes of the female reproductive tract, right? Now, whenever we have an epithelium that is ciliated, it's, it has a role, it, one of its functions is to move something. That's what cilia do, they, they're hair-like structures that move. So whenever we have an epithelium that has cilia on it, which is only a couple of examples, that one and another one we're gonna get to in a second, that means it's function in moving something across the surface of the epithelium. So here are just some specializations. At the apical sur surface, we have some specializations where we could have an increase in the membrane surface area in vaginations called microvilli, little bitty finger-like structures on the apical membrane. It helps increase the absorption of nutrients in the case of the small intestine because the very top of the cell is where you absorb your nutrients from. So if we have more membrane surface area up here, that means you can absorb more nutrients quicker. And so that's part of that specialization with microvilli. Now, when we have cilia at the surface, which are 
finger-like structures as well, but they look like little hairs. You can actually see, the, see them under the microscope quite well. The microvilli, you can't see too well under the microscope. You can see the little hairs on them. That's the little cilia at the surface. So the micro, I'm sorry, the, the cilia always beat in some wave-like motion to always move something across the surface of the epithelium. So whenever we talk about a ciliated epithelium, you know one of its functions is to move something. That's, that's the giveaway, right? Now, these membranes also have the mucus cells in them called goblet cells. It basically is a single-celled gland called a unicellular gland that secretes mucus. It's just for lubrication. Now, what are some of the other characteristics of simple columnar epithelium in general? Well, obviously, it's a simple epithelium, so there's only one row of cells. The nucleus of the column-shaped cells is located somewhat toward the basement membrane. Remember at the bottom of the epithelium right here? So this, the nuclei are more towards the bottom, towards where the basement membrane is located. Um, there are goblet cells that secrete mucus, and some of them may have cilia and or microvilli. Typically, if you have cilia, there's no microvilli and vice versa, right? Um, there are a non-ciliated type, which has the microvilli on them. And this is the tissue that's involved in absorption and secretion. So these cells, obviously, we want our, our food particles molecule to be absorbed through the cell from out here into the blood. In here, we absorb our nutrients from our food in the small intestine through the cells. So one of the functions of this simple non-ciliated columnar epithelium is going to be absorption. But these cells also have the ability to secrete substances just to the surface of the epithelium. In some cases, it's enzymes involved in digesting your food. In other cases, like this mucus goes to the surface, although those are single-celled gland, the surface of this tissue has mucus on it. So another function would be secretion, right? Absorption and secretion. So ciliated epithelium, uh, columnar epithelium, is involved in moving some sort of a fluid over the surface, as I mentioned before. So if we look at the fallopian tube again, the egg would be ovulated from the ovary, gets swept up into the fallopian tube, and the, the beating of these cilia down the length of this tube creates a current of fluid where the egg kind of floats down river. The egg just keeps flowing down with the current as the cilia beat in a forward wave-like movement. So movement of substances across the surface of the tissue. Now, where are these tissues located? Well, I already told you the simple non-ciliated columnar epithelium is lying in the inside of our gastrointestinal organs. Like a part of our stomach, not all of it, but a part of your stomach lining, and then down through your small intestine and the large intestine. So we call that the gastrointestinal tract or GI tract, if you never heard of that before. And then the only place that we have ciliated simple columnar epithelium in the human body is in the, fall in the fallopian tubes, in the uterine tubes. So simple ciliated columnar epithelium is not located in the male. All right, now we do have another type of ciliated epithelium, but it's not simple columnar epithelium. It's gonna be a, a pseudostratified one in a minute when we talk about that. All right, let's talk about stratified squamous and how we name it. Stratified squamous epithelium is named as stratified because there's multiple rows of cells. It's called squamous because of the cells more towards the apical surface. As we go from the bottom of a tissue that's, that's stratified, as we start getting to the top, the shape of the cells towards the top is typically how we name it. For instance, look at the bottom of this picture. The cells at the bottom kind of look like short columnar cells. As we move up, they start looking like more cuboidal cells. But as we move up, they, they're flattened out. 
So this tissue is actually called stratified squamous epithelium because yes, it's stratified, but it's called squamous because the cells more towards the surface are flat scale-like cells, right? So here's one look at a type of stratified squamous. Here's the basement membrane down here at the bottom. Here's the apical surface up here. And all of this is the stratified squamous, all right? Here's another picture of it. So just to show you several different pictures, this is the stratified squamous here. Hold on one second. The stratified squamous where we have a basement membrane at the bottom and all along here is the basement membrane. And then we go to the apical surface up here. Now, the difference between this picture and this one, besides you see this one looks a little thicker, they are stratified and this is stratified squamous, both of them. But the difference is what we call keratinized and non-keratinized. Keratinized stratified squamous is the type of tissue that lines the surface of your skin. And it's called keratinized because the cells at the very surface are all dead. So up here, we, it almost looked like little fibers up here. Th these are layers of dead squamous cells at the very top. So in our skin, the, strat the keratinized stratified squamous in our skin and other keratinized, I mean, in other uh, stratified squamous epithelium as well, the cells always migrate from the bottom. They're produced down here. They migrate through the tissue until they get to the top where they, in this case, they die when they get to the superficial layers and then they slough off the top. They're exfoliated off. So in a keratinized stratified squamous, you get the cells that are always made at the bottom. That's through mitosis. My, mitotic division occurs down here. They then get pushed up through the surface until they get to the surface. And in keratinized stratified squamous, they die. And it looks like we have all these dead fibers up here. In this type over here, <coughs> which is called non-keratinized stratified squamous, you still have the basement membrane at the bottom. You have this little basal layer of cells at the bottom where mitosis occurs. So down here at the bottom, our cells are constantly dividing. And when they divide, it pushes the cells upward and upward and upward and upward. They, they take a journey from the bottom to the top. However, in this particular stratified squamous, which is called non-keratinized, by the time the cells get to the very top or apical surface, they don't die, they just slough off, right? So here's another view of that. This is a non-keratinized stratified squamous. So everybody look at this. You might see more than one picture of it. You see down here at the bottom is the basement membrane. From that little bitty layer of purple cells there all the way to the top is the stratified squamous. This is what would be, we would call a non-keratinized stratified squamous. And I'm going to show you where it's located in a minute. So this is non-keratinized stratified squamous. Well, it's right here. This, this lines the vagina, the vaginal canal, is lined by non-keratinized stratified squamous. This is the same type of tissue, but found in your esophagus, the tube that connects your, your mouth to your stomach. Here's the basal membrane down here. Here's the bottom layer of cells at the very bottom. And this is the tissue layer here. So when the cells go from the bottom to the top, by the time they get to the top, they just slough off, they exfoliate off, but they, there's no dead layer. The only place that we have a dead layer of cells is in this keratinized stratified squamous, which is located lining the surface of your skin. So if you touch your skin, you are physically touching dead keratinized epithelial cells, squamous epithelial cells. That's what you're touching. When you have your cell, when you, like females and everybody, when you wash your face or anything, or when females exfoliate, you hear that term, you're basically getting dead cells off the surface of your skin. Now, you're not going to get all of them off unless you have an abrasion or, or a cut or something like that. 
you would have to cut these layers away, which we don't want to do. Those layers are a protective layer. So we're going to get into that. So let's talk about that a little bit. Keratinized versus non-keratinized. Keratinized stratified squamous is drier, it's tougher, and it's located on the top. I should have put top. Everybody can write that in later on, but located on the top of your skin, which is technically called the epidermis. So keratinized stratified squamous makes up the epidermis of our skin. That's what that would be called. Non-keratinized stratified squamous is a mucosal membrane where it's a, basically it's a moist membrane. It's more easily colonized by bacteria and other microbes because of that moisture in there. Some of those microbes are good microbes though. All of those microbes are not bad. We have some good ones. So our non-keratinized stratified squamous does not contain the dead cell layers at the top like the keratinized one does. These are all dead skin cell layers right here. Dead keratinized squamous epithelial cell layers at the top. Our non-keratinized uh, stra stratified squamous epithelium does not have those dead layers at the top. So our, sorry, our non-keratinized stratified squamous is located in your oral cavity inside your mouth. It's located in your throat, which the science name for your throat is called your pharynx. It lines your esophagus and the vaginal canal. That's where you find nine keratinized stratified squamous. So as far as the structure is concerned, obviously there's multiple layers. It's named for the cells at the apical surface where they flatten out. That's why we have squamous in the name. And their primary function is protection. Since there's multiple, multiple layers of cells, they can resist a friction and abrasion, and it makes a very, very efficient barrier for bad microbes or uh, pathogenic bacteria or other microbes from entering our body. I mean, look at your skin on your arm. Your skin, the very surface layer, is a, strat a keratinized stratified squamous. It is our physical barrier to the outside world. And it's a pretty good one. It does a pretty good job, except when we damage it. So if you cut your skin, burn your skin, have an abrasion, you open up those layers that are protecting the, you from the entry of bad pathogens, all right? So it's a very protective membrane for us. All right, I know you guys are tired. I'm almost done talking. So let's go through the last couple of epithelial tissues we have to cover. And then the last thing I want to do is show you a couple of pictures from a, a file that is in uh, the Canvas site, just in case some students haven't clicked on it yet. All right, so um, one of the last two types of tissues that we have to cover is called pseudostratified columnar epithelium. There basically are really two types of pseudostratified columnar, but we're only going to be looking at one type. Um, and that's the type that has cilia at the surface. So if you look at the real picture, you kind of can see it kind of looks like these little fibers at the top. It's not, this is not the best picture of it, but these are supposed, these are the cilia. So in this, this drawing of it, we see that the cells are tall. So they're column shaped, but, we say it's a pseudostratified epithelium because the nuclei are at different levels. They're staggered. And when they're staggered, you can see in the, the real slide over here, there's looks like there's some at the bottom and the middle. So at first glance, you might think this is a stratified epithelium. But ultimately, it is a simple layer. It's one layer. So it looks stratified, but it's not. So we say pseudostratified. So all of the cells touch the basement membrane, but not all of the cells reach the surface. So for that reason, some cells are tall, some cells are short. But by the sheer definition of me saying, if all the cells touch the bottom, you can only have one layer of cells. So it's called pseudostratified. We have to put ciliated in the name because there's cilia at the top. We say columnar 
because the majority of the cells are column shaped and it's an epithelium. So let's look at some of their structure and uh, characteristics. All right, Kelly, did you have a question? Because I, I think I heard your mic going off. All right, maybe not. All right, so pseudostratified columnar epithelium. There's one row of cells. Some of the cells are tall. All the cells touch the bottom, all right? Not all the cells reach the surface. There are mucus cells embedded in this epithelium that secretes a mucus. I guess I, sh I should have uh, shown you that. Um, where's my, here's the picture of it right here. All right, so these are the, the goblet cells again. They secrete mucus and that mucus gets embedded and the little cilia move the mucus across the surface of the epithelium. Oh, I forgot to show you. Here's another picture of it, a little bit better. You can see the, the uh, cilia. This is a, a slide taken from your windpipe, the trachea. So as we breathe in dirt and debris, these goblet cells secrete mucus up here. And as dirt and debris come into your trachea, it gets stuck on the mucus. And these cilia constantly beat in an upward fashion, moving the dirt, debris, and mucus to the top of your windpipe. This is actually called the mucociliary escalator, by the way. I'll say that again. The mucociliary, muco for mucus, ciliary because of cilia, the mucociliary escalator. Because everybody knows in the mall, the escalator, you know, brings you up or down. Now this one, we only want, we only want it to go up. We don't want the dirt and mucus to go deep in your lung. So this is a protection, preventing bad things, dirt, bacteria, uh, whatnot, from getting deep in our lung. It works pretty good, but sometimes it can be compromised, all right? In which case, you know, you, you, your lungs can uh, develop some fluid in there, get pneumonia and whatnot. So let's just go over that. So they're tall, they're column shaped. The nuclei are at different levels in the epithelium. Um, not all the cells reach the top. And then mucus gets trapped in that cilia. So the secretion of that mucus and the movement by the cilia moves the dirt and debris out of the system, which is called the mucociliary escalator. When you get cold viruses or bacterial infections or some people with asthma um, or severe allergies, sometimes that mucociliary escalator is compromised, in which case fluids can build up in the lung and you can develop pneumonia. Now that's not the only way that fluid gets in your lung, but that's just an example that I'm using. Now, the location of this particular type of pseudostratified epithelium is in the respiratory tract. In particular, in what's called the nasal cavity, really the posterior portion of it, uh, the middle to posterior portion is the nasal cavity, your windpipe is a trachea, and then the tubes that go into your lungs are called the bronchial tubes, if you never heard of that before. So at least in the larger bronchi that go into the lungs, it's uh, basically lined by the pseudo ciliated pseudostratified columnar epithelium. And it's involved in protecting us from uh, dirt and debris from getting deep into our lungs. All right, the last tissue type that we have to cover is called transitional. And you notice right away, here's the name of the epithelium right here, transitional epithelium. But look at the picture. The picture shows multiple layers of cells. This is the only one that has multiple layers of cells that we don't call stratified and or we don't call pseudostratified. Although this one is not pseudostratified, it's, it truly is stratified, but we don't say stratified transitional epithelium. We don't do that. It's taken to be stratified because there's only one type of transitional epithelium in the body, and that type is always stratified. That's why we don't have to say stratified after the name, I mean, in the name. So uh, transitional epithelium is stratified. There's anywhere up to eight layers of cells or so that form this epithelium. The cells at the bottom are kind of cuboidal in shape, and you see they're kind of cuboidal, and then at the top they get a little bit bigger, but the cells 
more towards the apical surface of this epithelium can change their shape. They can go from being broad, uh, big and, and wide, as you see here, to being flattened out, as you see in this picture. So right here, you see the cells kind of flat, like the nucleus, nucleus gets squished down some. This is transitional epithelium that lines parts of the urinary system, like the urinary bladder. So the transitional epithelium ultimately is going to function to allow a distortion, if you will, of the tissue without being damaged. Basically, it can stretch. So the tissue can stretch and the cells won't be damaged. So let's take this case. Here, here's a real picture of it. Here's a, a section through uh, the bladder. Um, and this is the transitional epithelium right here. This happens to be a slightly distended bladder with the cells at the top kind of stretched out a little bit, not too much. Here's another picture of it. So here's a picture that comes from your book. This is just another picture that was found put in the PowerPoint. And down here, you see the base membrane, connective tissue lies below it with some blood vessels in there. And then we have the transitional epithelium. Transitional epithelium is called transitional because the cells at the top go through a transition in shape. So as the tissue becomes stretched or when, as, as what happens when your bladder fills up with urine, it gets distended. These cells can change shape and the tissue does not become damaged, all right? So that's one of the main functions of that tissue. So let's go over its characteristics. First of all, transitional epithelium is str stratified. There are several layers. The majority of the cells are typically cube-shaped, other than when the cells at the surface start to change their shape. So they can be large and wide, or they can start to squish down to get flattened out from a large cuboidal shaped cell down to a squamous shape. And that happens when your bladder starts to stretch or is distended because your bladder is full. Now this transitional epithelium also lines other parts of the urinary tract uh, in your urinary system. It obviously lines your bladder. Most people put that down for a location uh, because you know what your urinary bladder is but you may not know what the urethra is or the ureters because we haven't covered the system yet. So lining parts of the urethra, not all of it, and lining parts of the ureters is a transitional epithelium. Just to let you know, the ureters are the tubes that carry urine from your kidneys to your bladder. The urethra is a single tube that carries urine from the bladder to the outside of the body. So these are just other tubes that are part of the urinary system. All right, now, so that concludes the information from the PowerPoint that I want to teach from. What I want to do now is before I take your questions, I want to stop sharing that part of my screen and show you our, whoops, I shared the wrong one again, it looked like. Hold on one second, I'm sorry. I want to show you our website. Here's our Canvas site. I'm gonna go into modules. There is another little PowerPoint that's very helpful. I wanna make sure y'all look at it, all right? Um, I'm sure most of you did, but down here where it says walk through of epithelia, all right? You should look at all of the, all the links in order to, to do your work and study in all the modules. So if I click on walk through epithelia, it pulls up another PowerPoint. And so there's other slides of the tissues in here, okay? So you need to look at these. It just gives you another perspective of the tissues that we just went through. For instance, here's a, another, a couple other diagrams of keratinized stratified squamous. Look how, how, how thick the dead cell layers are in this picture, as opposed to the other picture I just showed you, it was kind of thinner looking. So this is still keratinized stratified squamous. The living cells are here. The dead cells start right here all the way up. So this is the dead cell layer. This is the living cell layer in a, in a keratinized stratified squamous. So make sure you go through all of this. And if you have any questions in it, 
just, you know, email me and I'll answer it. But the real reason I wanted to also show you this is just to go over this. I didn't have a picture of this view of simple squamous epithelium in my other PowerPoint. So if we look at the very top of a simple squamous epithelium, you can see that the cells are broad and, well, kind of broad. And at first glance, you might think, oh, that's a cuboidal cell. This is not a cuboidal cell. When you see these cells that kind of look like eggs cooking a, uh, uh, in, a, in a pan, that is a top view, superior view of a simple squamous epithelium. You, you'll see kind of this uh, polygon, a uh, polygonal uh, gonial shape or hexagonal shape. See how it has these little things? In cuboidal cells, they would be more square. You won't see these angles in here like this. That's another identifying character, all right? And here are just some of the membranes. I told you earlier that simple squamous epithelium uh, makes up in the body. Mesothelial membranes, serous membranes, and, uh, and around some of the organs in the body that secrete fluid to help lubricate the organs that are moving like the heart in the pericardial membrane, the lungs in uh, the pleural membrane, so forth and so on. So those organs are lubricated by a, a what we call a serous fluid right here. It's a lubricating fluid produced by the simple squamous cells, all right? All right, so I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now. Um,